Yeah, so all right, everybody. Good morning. In this session at Group by Bob Ward is going to be talking about why SQL Server 2016 just runs faster. If you have any questions, there's a Q&A or a questions panel over in GoToWebinar. You can type in your questions over there. Some of them I'll just type in answers to as Bob is going along, but we'll hold the answers for the last, say, 10 minutes of the session. If you have any problems seeing the screen, you can readjust the size of it. You can also move our webcams around from one place to another. So with that housekeeping out of the way, take it away, Bob. Brent, thank you so much. Guys, I'm so honored, and Brent, thank you. Honor for the folks that, that rated my talk uh, to be part of this uh, first ever Group by event. So I'm excited to be here. As Brent talked about, my session to start this whole event off talks about SQL Server 2016. And, you know, there's a lot of cool features in SQL Server 2016, such as always encrypted and query store and so forth. But my goal today, in the next 80 minutes, uh, with 10 minutes to, uh, at the end for questions, uh, 70 minutes with 10 minutes at the end of questions is to kind of convince you that with very little changes to an application, uh, moving to SQL Server 2016 can actually make your application run faster. Um, I've done this presentation at a couple of the different events. I've actually got a new twist today uh, to add in an additional demo. And we got a couple of demos as well as we go through the uh, go through the deck. A couple of logistics. Brent mentioned about questions. Certainly put them all in there. And if you know me, I'm committed to answering any question you have. Um, so we'll have about 10 minutes at the end to answer questions, but if we don't get through those, we will find a clever way to make sure we post those on my blog, or I'll make sure I can even uh, answer those directly, bobward at microsoft.com. I'm a big believer in getting my materials to you, so if you go right now to aka.ms slash bobwardms, there's a presentations folder, it's a OneDrive folder, this deck and the demos that I'm going to show you are all out there for you. So no, no questions about how to try to get all this stuff. It's all there. If you see me running queries or something of that nature, there's no, no need to take screenshots and those kind of type things. You'll have it all available to you. So let's get right into the material. Um, kind of a little quick story about how we got to this whole situation. Myself and my colleague, Robert Dorr, we kind of run a fun little blog called Bob Sequel. His name is Bob Dorr. I'm Bob Ward. Um, a couple of years ago, when we were both on support team and we started taking a look at what the product team was doing with SQL Server 2016, um, we noticed that there was some performance enhancements that they were making to the core engine. And we kind of started digging in this going like, why are they doing this? And it kind of dawned on us that if you think about SQL Server 2016, a lot of the fundamentals of the engine date back to SQL 7.0 in the, in the late 90s. And technology has kind of moved on, right? If you think about faster I.O., faster networks, denser core CPU type technology, we have to make sure that the core algorithms and some of the features we've got in the engine, you know, kind of keep up or stay ahead of the pace of that technology. And, and that's kind of what got born of the, out of the situation. Bob started doing interviews with members of the product team to say, well, what about this change you made here? Why did you do this? And so what I hope to show you today is a little bit of the history or, or, or the, the result of the history of that research behind it. And, and when Bob came to my office and was talking about this concept, he says, you know, Ward, he calls me Ward. He goes, I think this thing just runs faster. And I said, ah, there's a brand name. You know, let's stick with that. Let's go out on the road and show people about these kind of type things, why SQL Server 2016 just runs faster. And the, the second point here in the slide is, you know, this is how we kind of ran into this. It was all about customer experience. I mean, this is uh, customer issues reported through support, uh, MVPs telling us uh, scenarios through, connect, uh, through the Connect site or just uh, MVP telling us about problems they're running into or customer benchmarks we were doing using technology like XEvent and XPerf and kind of the themes that we found through this investigation of what we changed, you know, it's all about scalability. Um, I have this new term for you called reverse scalability. And what I mean by that is customers' expectations of moving to new hardware and perhaps even a new version of SQL Server or perhaps maybe a new version of SQL Server with the same hardware and not getting the scalability they expect, uh, but it, it's actually worse. Not even getting the performance as the same as before, but getting worse performance. So moving to bigger hardware and actually getting worse performance before what I call reverse scalability. And we ran into that. And so some of the techniques that you see on this screen are kind of what you're going to hear about today. Partitioning is a big concept about scalability. You're going to find about several scenarios where we partition things in order to achieve that scalability. Parallelism. You know, you all know about parallel queries in SQL Server, but we have certain situations in the engine where we've decided to do other things in parallel different than queries and allowing us to get the scalability we'd like from the engine. You know, sometimes things just, we just decide to do things more or larger. I mean, I'm literally serious that we have this concept called log writer in the engine 
and we said, you know what, what if we actually just added more of those? <laughs> what if we thought on a scalable system with Numa nodes, if we just added like one per node, would we be faster? And sure enough, we were. And so, you know, we tried to make sure that the engine was attuned accordingly to run with more log riders, but just by doing some of those type of analysis and experimentation allowed us to get faster. Dynamic response is an area where we said, you know, in some cases we don't want to automatically partition things to start with, but perhaps we could dynamically respond to a problem. We could observe a problem that's going on the engine, and without the users really kind of noticing there was an issue, we'd get ahead of it and actually partition on the fly. And then finally, improved algorithms. So in some cases, we just said, look, we're using a spin lock in this part of the SQL Server code. We don't even need to do that anymore. We'll use some sort of lock-free approach like we're doing in Inram LTP. Let's just do that instead and see if it's actually got better performance. And that actually is some examples we did there. Before I kind of show you uh, some examples uh, of what this actually looks like, one thing that's very important to note here, nothing that I have in this deck today, nothing, none of the features I'm talking about, the enhancements I'm making and showing you, have anything to do specifically for addition of SQL Server. Now, you may know now that in SQL Server 2016 SP1, we actually have enhanced or lit up some features that you didn't have available for in standard in things like standard edition, but anything I'm showing today is not specific to enterprise edition. Now, it could be there is still a feature that is enterprise only that we've enhanced, but none of the changes we've got listed out here are specific to a, a specific SKU. Before I go into these features, I want to make sure you're aware of two things. And, and I added this slide after I start, started first doing this presentation because I think a lot of people that even if you're just fundamentally familiar with SQL Server, are not aware of these two technologies, column store indexes and in Memorial TP. Both of these are available before SQL 16 and have been enhanced in SQL 16, but these query performance numbers that I'm listing to the right over here are not just made up stuff. I mean, these are actual observations from the lead program managers of these features. When I talked to them, I said, hey, what kind of numbers are you seeing with, with actual customers? These are the kind of type input uh, improvements you can see from using these technologies by adopting them. And in these particular cases, these are one in some cases that do require some changes uh, as opposed to some of the things I'm going to talk about. But I want to make sure you're aware of these because these could absolutely help you make your application faster, your SQL database faster, just by uh, adopting these technologies. And in one particular case, we're going to talk about enhancement. We've actually made the column store in SQL 16. This is the list. Uh, you're going to see throughout my deck here these hyperlinks uh, throughout the deck. When you get them, uh, click on them. They actually go to reference information. In this particular case, this hyperlink that says Just Runs Faster actually points to the Bob SQL blog uh, in a series of blog posts that Robert Dorr started and I've actually enhanced that talk about all these functionality and features. There's no way in the next 60 minutes now that we're going to be able to cover all this stuff. So I'm going to pick a selected few from this list and kind of go over them and talk about why we did it and how they work and how it can make you faster. And it, of course, we'll do a couple of demos. The little um, stickers that say new right there are just things that I've introduced since I first started doing the series that may or may not have a blog post yet that we need to actually produce. So this is the list, and I've got a sticker here that says th there is more because there is more. There's actually more that are out there on the blog that I don't even have on this list because I've run out of space on this slide now. And there's more uh, that is listed at the back of the deck uh, that we don't have, that we don't even have a blog post yet, and we haven't even researched yet, but we know about that there's a feature. Now, another thing that's really interesting when you get this PowerPoint deck and look at it, if there's a particular feature on here, like multiple log writers that I don't cover today, I have to ha I actually have at the back of the deck something called bonus material. And bonus material is a set of slides that I've built that do talk about these features that you can read over and look more at, also pointing to the blog post. Uh, in, in the case that you see something today that you wish I'd, I'd cover but you want to learn more about. So a lot of good information available in this PowerPoint deck when you get it, both for just viewing this information in this presentation and for reference for later. So let's dig into core engine scalability and talk about NUMA. And if you think about NUMA technology, uh, I, I hearken back to when I look at this slide here to machines that I used in the late mid to late 90s, SMP machines, uh, that had eight CPUs, and I thought I was the king, man. I had a <laughs> Unisys server with eight CPUs back in SQL 7.0, and I was doing testing and support, and I thought I was like the greatest guy in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you look at this and think about this technology, as CPUs grew more in these machines to say like 32 or even 64, bottlenecks started to arise within the hardware itself, right? Thus was born this NUMA architecture where we effectively partitioned CPUs into their own little mini computers with their own local memory bus and local memory access to make things faster. Hence that term partitioning you see come into play here. Well, in SQL 2005, we're very fortunate that Slava Oaks and the developers of SQL OS, 
they thought of NUMA way back then and said, let's build in the SQL Server the capabilities of recognizing NUMA and taking advantage of those technologies. And most of these original designs had no more than eight CPUs. Well, multi-core takes hold in the, into the industry. Uh, first of all, dual-core, then hyper-threading kick in, but then it's multi-cores. And, and, you know, you can get CPUs in the market now easily with 24-plus cores uh, for just a given socket. And now what you see is sometimes these NUMA nodes experience the same bottleneck within the node that occurred in these SMP machines. And so you think like spin locks that we use inside SQL Server, they don't scale sometimes in these scenarios. So in SQL Server 16, we decided to do something very interesting. We decided to further partition the NUMA concept in what I call kind of a soft or virtual concept. So if you've got a hardware NUMA node scenario where we detect more than eight physical processors per your node, by default, SQL Server will partition these nodes into further nodes and more uh, into less number of processors per these nodes than the physical configuration. Now we're not changing the hardware configuration, we're just changing SQL's view of what NUMA looks like. And so you might ask yourself, well, why would you do this? Well, any code in our engine that benefits from NUMA partitioning can get a boost. For example, in the slide here, I list something called IOCP worker, which is called the IO completion port worker. That's a dedicated thread that handles like TDS packets coming into SQL Server. Well, by default, we build one per node. So if we actually add more nodes to the hardware configuration of NUMA nodes, then we'll get more of these workers and therefore theoretically get a boost in connectivity and batch throughput just because we have more of these workers. So the results are interesting and you look at these slides, I've got these little green uh, shapes that I'll show you in the right hand corner in many of these. These are some of the performance enhancements that uh, we actually observe by making some of these changes. So you look at the last one here, uh, a workload derived from our TPC benchmarks. We simply were taking some of these workload benchmarks we have internally, we would actually stick it on a server we would uh, then just turn on Autosoft NUMA partitioning and see a 25% increase. So the core engine itself has several other areas where it uses NUMA node partitioning, and just by using this technology, we're seeing performance enhancers from the server. It's on by default, and there's an alter server configuration parameter to turn it off if for whatever reason you see that there's an issue with it. So I thought it'd be interesting for you to see kind of more of a visual about how this actually works. So this is a, a based on a machine that I have on the, on the labs here in Microsoft that I use often. It's a four socket, 18 core hyper threaded machine, which what that means is, is that for each node you get 36 logical CPUs, so total of 144. And this is a picture of a hardware node, a memory node. And these numbers represent the CPU IDs. Now I listed them in this way on purpose. A zero and a one vertically represent one physical core uh, of the CPU. So 36 logical CPUs, 18 cores. So what SQL Server does when it sees this configuration, it'll take this particular memory node and it'll actually break it up into these four logical nodes within SQL Server's own code to actually see it that way, all for the purposes of scheduling worker threads. Now, if you look at the pattern of these numbers, it, it, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a method to the madness here. There's a rhyme for the reason why we did this. So in node zero, you notice it's zero, two, four. It's not zero, one, two, three consecutively. You'll also notice here that for uh, CP1, it doesn't show up on node one, it shows up on node two, and here's why. So we, we first try to avoid putting two logical CPUs from the same core on the actual same soft node. That's because we're trying to do as much as we can to avoid any conflicts of running worker threads on the same actual physical core. In addition, we try to avoid putting physical cores on sequential nodes because for degree of parallelism, for actual parallel queries, that's often how we just schedule the work. We just say, hey, start running these subqueries on consecutive node numbers. So yeah, you still could spill over depending on your degree of parallelism, but we're trying to get smart about how we actually configure these nodes uh, in, in a logical way. If you look here, we've taken this concept of 36 and broken them to four nodes of nine. And the, the method there is, is that we're going to try to get close to that magical eight number as possible. So we are one over eight at nine, but that's how we actually break these things up. Now, if you go look at things like the DMVs, like DMOS nodes or DMOS memory nodes, you can see a mapping of the fact that there's still a hardware node out there that we, we can't ignore uh, from a memory perspective. So there is a mapping to these. And we try to make sure that these four logical nodes still appear and mapped in SQL Server on the same hardware node, which is memory node zero. And you'll see that in there. And in fact, 
I actually, after doing this talk and getting a lot of questions in this space, especially when it comes to like virtual machines, um, I've got a blog post uh, that is linkable off this slide where you can go in there and see how I took various types of machine configurations, both this one, a VM, and another machine I have, and you can see what the error log looks like and what the DMVs look like and the binary mappings to CPU IDs. You can get a picture of what that all sees here. And so it was my contention that out of the gate, you move to SQL 16, we use this NUMA configuration, and you can get much great benefits from it uh, in these high dense core uh, NUMA scenarios. So dynamic memory objects, uh, you can see how this is going to go today, right? We're just going to take a tour through some of these type of features and talk about how they work, why we did it, what kind of benefit you can see from it. So dynamic memory objects is an example of this dynamic response concept that we built in SQL Server that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So memory objects are a concept in SQL. If you don't know what they are, uh, if you think about most of the memory allocated in SQL Server, most of it comes from things like buffer pool or procedure cache, which is, you know, things like buffer pool are like 8K pages. Well, SQL has other memory needs for its own purpose, for different data structures and overhead within SQL, things like connection memory of that sort. And so we use this concept called memory objects, which are a little bit like Windows heaps, if you've ever done Windows programming before. Variable size types of memory we need to allocate. Well, if you've spent any time understanding how memory management works in an operating system, when you allocate memory, you must track this memory. You must track who's allocating, how much have they allocated. And so what happens is you literally have a list of structures in memory that track the memory you're allocating, things like linked lists and so forth that track all this information. Well, whenever you build a system like that and you have multiple threads that are global in nature, you have to protect it so that you know, one person doesn't try to step over the memory that's being allocated by a different thread. And so we have this concept in SQL Server for these global memory objects called C memthread weights. When you have a lot of different threads that are all trying to access these memory object structures and they run into hot contention, you will get a C memthread weight problem as you see from things where you normally see weight types in DM exec requests or OS weight stats. And we consider a hot memthread to be one where you get a lot of weights and, a, and maybe a higher average wait time per wait. So as it turns out, we built an infrastructure in the engine to create these memory objects and these structures so that they're automatically partitioned by node or CPU. But there's a little bit of overhead to do that. So we don't do it by default for a lot of these. Now, we also built in the concept that if a particular memory object is already partitioned by node, you can promote it by using this trace flag 8048. And that's something we've blogged about and people have actually used in these scenarios. But here's what happens. Customers can contact support, or somehow the product team finds out, that one of these memthread weight problems are occurring because of a given memory object, and we end up creating a hotfix for it. You know, a customer has a scalability problem, we see a weight, it's on a memory object that we didn't think was going to be a scalability issue, we had spatial was one we ran into a, a year or so ago, and we run into these from time to time. And so we said to ourselves, there's got to be a better way. I mean, why do we have to create a hotfix every time when somebody runs into one of these things? Why can't this just work and respond to if a problem occurs? Either partition these ahead of time, or as you see a problem occurs, why don't you partition on the fly? And that's exactly what we do. So behind the scenes, a C memthread weight scenario could happen, but it happens in such a tight time frame that you don't even notice it, and we would automatically partition by node and eventually by CPU to try to make this a very scalable solution. And in fact, this is a small little perfmon graph, and you're going to see an example in a second, a demo I'm going to do, and this right here represents kind of the inflection point where the batches go up from a scalability perspective and the weights go down automatically to almost zero. And kind of it's my contention here, this just just work now. You don't even notice this is occurring. And in many tests we've run, we've seen 3x improvements in memory allocation with less CPU being used, which I'll explain in a second, just by doing that. So you know what? Let's take a look. You know, why have slides the whole time you're doing a presentation? Why don't you see a demo? So I've got a perfmon chart here that shows you thread safe memory object weights per second, which is equivalent to the C memthread weight concept. I have batches per second, I have processor time. Now, this is the funny twist to this whole thing here. Um, uh, this feature, when it's turned on by default, which is the default when you install SQL Server, this problem, if you run it, happens so fast, like you can't even detect the problem. So there's this undocumented trace flag here to turn off the feature so you can see the problem first, and then I'll turn the feature back on. So I have a, a stress scenario to run here. 
that you can have access to yourself after this presentation. And I'm going to run this. I'm going to start seeing the weights that actually occur here. Now let me go ahead and just scale these counters so you can see them a little bit better. Let's see. Let's get this one scaled. Yeah. So basically what you have here is you have weights here occurring and you have batches per second occurring. Uh, let's actually scale this one a little bit differently. Yeah, let's do that. So you see here I've got batch requests per second happening at a certain rate. I've got these memory uh, weights occurring here at a, at, a, at a rate as well when I'm running this repro here. Let me go back here. And this is kicking in here. So by me now going ahead and turning on the scenario here, let me go back and look here. I've got a DMV, and this is a fairly complicated query for you to take a look at here. Uh, this is actually going to show you for a particular memory object the, some of the contention that can occur because of this, and also the fact whether this is partitionable or not. Now, in this particular scenario, uh, what I'll do is I'll actually go ahead and turn on this feature, and let's observe the results. Let me go ahead and scale this back here. So what can happen in this scenario here as these batches are running is all of a sudden these weight, particular weights can go down to zero as you see here. And notice here that the particular batches went up. Now it isn't significant with this particular demo here, but can you see here the inflection point as the weights go down, how the batches go up here? It used to be at some sort of rate here around 2,000 or so, and now it's up in the 3,000 type level range. So SQL Server was observing weights, they occurred, and batches go up. Now, if you go back up here and look at this query that we were talking about for the DMVs and run it again, you can see here that automatically we've partitioned this by CPU. This contention factor is a new column we've added to this DMV that you can see the actual weights and the contention occurring in the system. Now, in a normal scenario, when you're running SQL Server, you don't even see this is happening. I'm actually showing you uh, an example here using this trace flag so you can observe the behavior. I turn off the trace flag, which basically turns on the default behavior, and automatically partition things. So it's our intention here that this core design of the engine is something that you don't have to worry about. We partition on the fly, and if you were in this demo without turning that trace flag, this happens so quick that you don't even see the scaling factor occur within the engine itself. So pretty interesting uh, feature that we've added. Uh, something that just works by default that you don't normally see, but you can see now that what we've added is the intention of keeping things scalable and dynamically responding. Let's talk another core, in, uh, core engine scalability feature called Parallel Redo. And if you don't know enough about or not sure you're sure of the details of how we do recovery in SQL Server, there are basically three phases. And here's a pointer to a primer about how it actually works. Effectively, it's the analysis phase, redo phase, and undo phase. Analysis is going and scanning the log to determining what we have to do, what transactions do we have to go commit <clears throat> that were in the transaction log, but the pages on disk don't reflect those changes, and what transactions we have to roll back, where page, uh, the changes on uh, the pages themselves have been reflected, but the log says they weren't committed, so we've got to undo those. And so if you think about the redo phase, um, it's all about applying changes to pages. You know, there's committed transactions in the log itself, we look at the page on disk, it's not reflective of that actual change, so we need to redo that change on the page to make things consistent. <clears throat> and typically, it's I.O. bound, because we're reading these pages from disk, we're going and making the changes here, there's a lot of that work to do to make that happen. And so, we've not really had to worry about doing anything special in the redo code in the past, because I.O. devices have been at such a latency level uh, that I.O. is usually the bottleneck. But if you think about the typical fast I.O. devices that are on the market now with latency sometimes less than a millisecond, you know, we were running tests all of a sudden and realized, hey, maybe our redo code is the bottleneck now. And so we said, what if we did this in parallel? You know, if we did things in a parallel fashion, we could utilize more of the CPU and actually make this faster. And that helps scenarios like secondary replicas where you're continuously running redo scenarios so that you can go read and see the changes happening in a secondary fashion. But if you think about doing things in parallel in the log and redoing, you've got to still, still things, keep things consistent. So here's what we did. We built a parallel pool, a redo worker pool, and these parallel redo tasks uh, you see right here are actually the same as the command you might find in DM exec request when you see this occurring when we run recovery. Now this worker pool is simply SQL Server worker threads that we dedicate during recovery to doing this task. So it's not some special different pool that we're building. We're just dedicating certain ones for the normal worker pool to do this task. 
We also have something called the dirty page table inside SQL Server that's used for recovery purposes. And so here's what we did that's quite clever. We said, let's take the dirty page table, which is a list of pages that we must go make changes to to do commits for redo phases, and let's partition it by page ID. And then let's actually take each redo parallel worker and assign it a page ID, and then in order, apply the necessary log changes to make things consistent. So one parallel worker cannot touch the changes to a different page. This keeps things a very consistent way, but yet in a parallel way. So I get page one, page two, and page three. I need to go apply all the changes in order to page one, and I can do this at the same time and still maintain consistency because I'm not taking any changes and applying them from one page to the other across these log sequence numbers. Now, versus standalone recovery where I don't do things in parallel, I do it in serial, I've seen up to 80% increase in performance. And I've got a little pointer here on the slide as well about you may be asking, how many of these things do I get? Does it get out of control? Well, it's basically the number of cores in your system, what these pool looks like per database. There's a max per DB and a max for the instance itself. Only use when we're actually running recovery, which would occur, of course, when you're doing a restore, continuous redo, or when you're actually restarting SQL Server. So let's see this in action. Now, in order to, you know, to, to make sure we use the, our time wisely today, um, <clears throat> if I actually ran the scenario, it would take several minutes. So instead, what I'm showing you here is, is a couple things. One is, this is the result of an extended event session showing off a new feature of SQL 16 with an event called Database Recovery Trace that shows you the difference between a serial execution and a parallel execution of redo on a database. So, First of all, this is actually just handy for looking at recovery scenarios. If you've got a slow recovering scenario and you want to trace some of the details of it, you can actually see that by using this extended event trace session. And if you're asking yourself, well, how do I turn on this extended event trace session if it's starting SQL Server? It's like a chicken and the egg concept. You can actually build this X event session, and it's in my demo scripts, where you can say startup equals on. We will start up this session before we run recovery. So the X event uh, kicks in. It's already running. When recovery runs, you'll get all the information you need. The way I run this in serial, by the way, is another undocumented trace flag, not because we're trying to hide something, but because you don't normally need it. But it's in the deck as in, in the notes section, and it's there just for testing purposes so you can see the difference between a serial execution and a, redo, and a uh, parallel execution. So in the serial case here, uh, you can see the phases of recovery. Here's like the analysis phase. Here's the amount of log we're trying to process, which is like 7 gig in this case. <clears throat> and if you see here, with the redo phase starting, it starts here about like what, 9, 43, 22 seconds. Here's the uh, phase starting. And if you go down here, you can see that it finishes about 16 seconds later. So about 16 seconds of redo time, and actually in the error log and in this trace, it tells you the breakout of how long it takes to do analysis, redo, and undo. So 16 seconds. Now here's the parallel case where we're not using the trace flag. First of all, notice here that there's additional entries talking about the fact that parallel redo is enabled for this database and the different workers that are started for this process. And if you look here at the phases of redo, this one here starts at 9.35.59, uh, 9, uh, and you can see here about 10 seconds later we now finish. So a 10 second uh, execution time for the same type of recovery that's occurring here versus 16 seconds. Now that doesn't sound all that impressive just for running the scenario, but this is a very small database. And um, as you get into a scenario where we actually can add more parallel workers depending on how many cores for a large amount of redo this actually can get faster and actually more scalable. So you know again this just works by default this is no turning any kind of feature on you don't have to actually observe and make any changes we just run parallel redo by default <clears throat> we take advantage of the number of cores in your system and uh, database recovery trace a new nice diagnostic feature for you to take advantage of in SQL 16. All right, let's move on and talk a little bit about DBCC. Nobody cares about DBCC, I'm sure. Um, and certainly it's something that in support I've certainly paid attention to over the years. <laughs> well, in 2008 time frame, I had this passion uh, to make check faster. Uh, I was just tired of some of the times I was hearing about CheckDB uh, that was running. And I thought to myself, what can I really, really go after? Uh, running a full check DB is a little bit difficult because of all the different index checks we have to make from a logical perspective. It's kind of hard to put your, your head around how to make that faster. But I thought to myself, could we make check DB with physical only faster? And here's why. Check DB physical only is pretty much reading all the pages from disk and doing an audit on the pages. That's really what it comes down to. So if that's what's going on here, how do we make that as fast as possible? And I've got something I call the, the backup to null test. Um, that's kind of my 
benchmark to try to compare how fast we can do this. And if you didn't know this trick before, this is an old old trick that's been around for a while. If you back up a database to a device called NUL, and that is not a typo, by the way, NUL is, is, is just one L, um, back up to disk equals NUL, that tells SQL Server, go ahead and read all the pages from the database to back them up, and basically do nothing after that. Don't write it anywhere, because null is like an empty bit bucket device. So in a way, you're really effectively testing the disk speed of how fast we can read pages from disk. So in 2008, we made some changes to make that faster. We also made some other changes in that time frame between 2008 and 2012. And what we deserved is, is that we could improve the design of the multi-object scanner latch, which I'm sure you've heard of before. It's an internal latch we use to actually protect data structures as we're reading pages from disk over multiple objects. Well, in 2016, we said we can make this better. And what's interesting here, as I show here, talk about the no-lock approach, is that the developers of the Hecaton project in Roman OTP, they're used to not doing latches, of getting rid of latches in their design. They took a look at this and said, look, you don't even need that latch anymore internally, guys, doing CheckDB. You can use a no-lock approach, and you can improve your read-ahead capabilities on these pages. And here's kind of the observations. On a SAP-type database, which is a large number of object database, uh, with one terabyte, we out of the gate with no changes to anything got 7x performance gains from CheckDB with physical only. And more, the more parallels and the better uh, to a point. Uh, you know, there's a threshold here depending on your system you can run into. But we were achieving scalability results here, not reverse scalability, but scalability results here just because of this change. And in fact, with a small database of 5 gig, I've been able to see 2x faster performance uh, using physical only. And so this is a, a chart that one of the developers gave me, and this chart is not uh, what you think it may be. Um, the bars, as they get bigger, are actually a total duration. So you can see, as you go across the board with degree of parallelism, this is that reverse scalability concept. Things get worse as you go across parallelism versus getting better. And in the case of the no-lock approach, which are the orange bars, things get better or actually stay the same as you move across parallelism. And so, again, 7x faster performance from one terabyte database with multiple objects. Uh, our ability to go into the core engine, you make no changes, you still just run CheckDB physical only, you get faster performance. A full CheckDB could see some advantage of this, but I think it depends a lot on, uh, you know, what other things CheckDB has to do with how many indexes you have and so forth. But certainly physical only is something that has had uh, vast improvements from this change. So TempDB, another topic that nobody really cares about, uh, has never been talked about in the SQL Server community. In fact, is it probably the most contentious point in the history of the product? Maybe. And I certainly have been a part of that discussion. And in fact, there's a link on here from a past summit talk I've done uh, on Inside TempDB where I talk about this concept of multiple data files. And, you know, it was my contention back in 2011, and I still have that, that feeling today, that one file per logical processor up to eight and then add four and doesn't help, doesn't, doesn't help anymore is kind of a, a, a motto I've used and I think it's been successful in looking at TempDB uh, multiple file performance scenarios. And the thing to remember here about multiple files with TempDB is that it's really not about I.O. Sure, it's true that you could take TempDB files and spread them across disks and when we have to do I.O. for TempDB, which remember, for TempDB user tables, uh, we don't do checkpoints on those, right? So it's really only in the case where we have to spill those to disk because of a memory cont a memory pressure problem, or sort spills or hash warnings or those forth where we do I/O. So you could get advantage from that. But the whole reason to add a bunch of files here is all about allocation contention for pages like GAM, SGAM, and PFS. And so if you really think what you're doing, you're adding multiple files, is you're partitioning the allocation contention for TempDB. You're helping create scalability by partitioning our allocation structures across multiple files. And so what have we done in SQL 16? Well, first of all, by default, we have gone in and said, we're going to give you, by default, one file per logical CPU up to eight. And then in setup, you have a new tab here, and you have also the setup options through the unintended install choices to add more, if you'd like. We also made the autogrow interval for, uh, for TempDB to be 64 meg. That aligns perfectly what we call a PFS interval. So by default, if an autogrow does kick in, we have less contention on the PFS page because we actually are going to grow by one PFS interval uh, by default. We also allow you to spread your file across drives in setup by simply adding a, a set of folders here. And we'll just round rob and add these files across these uh, folders or drives. And then the, the transaction log now has an 8 meg uh, default as well. So new defaults in SQL 16. 
set up obviously new choices to configure TempDB to your, to your liking during the setup process. None of these existed before SQL 16. So does anybody even care? Does it even really matter? Well, look at this chart that I, I dusted off back from my 2011 talk. I took that repro and I ran it again against SQL 16. And notice the difference here, seconds being the total duration of this workload that I did using OStress. And you can see here, just by going to eight files, a measurable uh, performance uh, increase. And then in this particular uh, machine, going to 32, and then things kind of tapered off, right? Now, you may be asking by looking at this chart here, what about this trace flag here? What does this 118 thing mean? Well, in the back of the deck, there is a slide talking about trace flags. Trace flag 118, which has been used forever, is on now by default. In fact, funny story is if you turn the trace flag on, we actually give you a warning in the airlog saying, hey, you don't even need that anymore. So we're not even going to recognize your trace flag. Um, trace flag 117, which is used for uh, auto-growing files at the same interval, that's also on by default for TempDB. Both of those options uh, for 118, which is uniform extent allocation, and 117 for multiple TempDB files, both of those particular options are available now through altered database commands for user databases. For TempDB, we just turn them on by default. So what about just simple scenarios? Well, my little poor man's eight, uh, laptop here with eight logical CPUs, if I run a TempDB stress of 2014 out of the box, 16 out of the box, I get 2x type performance benefits. Now it is true that if you configure 2014 to have all the proper number of data files uh, as SQL 16, you'll get similar performance. But out of the box, without making any changes to 16 or 14 on my eight CPU machine, uh, I got 2x performance. You know, 2x performance out of the box on an eight CPU box. So again, and you, if you take a look at many different scenarios, it is even conceivable that from a file perspective and a trace-like perspective, you may have to make not any changes to TempDB except for maybe the size of the files to avoid auto-grow uh, when you're first going out of the gate. So there's TempDB out of the box, better performance of 16 by default choices you made, and giving you the ability to be more uh, flexible in configuring it uh, during the setup process. So I.O. is an interesting topic. Uh, lots of different things in I.O. we've done. Some of these listed at the back of the deck. I picked out two in particular uh, that I think you'll have interest in. Instant file initialization is one of those. And, you know, I say in the slide here, this has been around since SQL 2005. And so you may be asking, you know, why are you even talking about this in SQL 16? Well, there's a couple reasons. There's, a, there's an important change we made during setup that I'm going to talk about in a second. But also because I think a lot of people miss this feature. Uh, they miss turning this on, and they miss a big performance boost. And also, it's important for you to know, like, what, how does this work? I mean, why is it even important? Well, prior to 2005, the, the speed to create a database uh, based on size was the speed to write zeros to the disk. And the reason is, that's how you create a file of a given size. If you say, hey, you know, I want a 10-gig file, create me a 10-gig database file. Uh, for the operating system, you got to create the file, and then you have to grow the file. So we would write zeros to this thing to grow it out to 10 gig. Well, on slower disk systems, you know, that takes a while, right? So Windows came along and introduced a new API call that we took advantage of SQL Server called Set File Valid Data. And Set File Valid Data works this way. Instead of you creating a file and writing out zeros to create and grow your file, you would just tell Windows, hey, I want a 10 gig file. And Windows would come back and say, you know what, here you go, you got 10 gig. In the snap of your fingers. In fact, creating a file for a database became almost the same speed regardless of size. A 10 gig file to create a database was almost the same size as creating a 1 gig file. And this is quite handy for us, and this is a concept that we started using in SQL 2005. Well, you know, you may ask yourself, for create database, I don't care. You know, I'll go create a database here at my desk, I'll go to lunch, I'll come back and it's finished, big deal. But you do care about restore. You care about how fast it takes to do that. And you definitely care about auto-grow, because this same process to auto-grow a file has to take place. And that can be a major blocking problem. So if you've got a major blocking problem because of auto-grow, it, it occurs because you're trying to actually run a transaction that's inserting a row, for example. We have to allocate a new page. We don't have space. We've got to auto-grow the file by X number of gig. And so you could block the world just because we're trying to grow this file by a certain amount of size. So instant finalization could be a great benefit to you. Now, there's a catch to all of this. First, the the session or the, the, the actual um, security role for the task that's trying to create this file must have the performance volume maintenance task privilege. And of course you all memorize that, right? Everybody knows what the performance volume maintenance task privilege is. I, I forget it half the time, right? So, um, you know, that's something that's a little bit of a pain for you have to remember what that is. And by default, we do not do that for the SQL Server account. And the reason we don't do that is because some people perceive this as a security 
concern. Now, I don't believe it is that way, but let me explain why they think that. So if you have this privilege, you can see any bytes in the space on disk that were previously there when we create this file. So if you create a 10 gig file and Windows comes back and says, hey, here's 10 gig, what Windows has really done is it's reserved for you the space on the disk for that 10 gig, but it didn't touch the bytes on disk. So if you have the privilege, you could actually see whatever was allocated previously there on disk. Now, if you don't have that privilege, Windows would only present zeros to you. So if you were just a user, you would not actually see those bytes. So the only people seeing these bytes are the session that actually has these privileges, which by default are Windows admins or somebody that you actually assign access to, which could be the SQL Server account, right? Now, the transaction law cannot take advantage of this, and there's a lot of myths around why that doesn't occur, but the main reason is because we have to rely on a known byte pattern. We can't, we can't worry about the fact there were previous bytes on disk that may have existed there. We have to look for a known byte pattern to find the tail of the end of the log to see how to scan the log. That's why the transaction law can't rely on it. For SQL 16, you know, the reason why it's important that you even talk about this is because instead of having to worry about what this privilege is, instead of having to worry about what Windows tool called the local policy editor you have to do to go turn on the privilege, we just give you a little checkbox. So when you're running setup and you're uh, actually configuring the service accounts, you just check this, click this checkbox, and here all of a sudden, now we've assigned the SQL database engine account to that privilege. It exists also in the silent install as a, as a switch for you to turn on in the configuration file, and the new installer for developer evaluation and express editions will turn this uh, feature on actually by default. If you've never looked at the new installer, I encourage you to do that. You can install now a developer edition like in three clicks um, where you couldn't before. It's 200% faster, easy for you to test. You can take a 10 gig database on your laptop. You can not run this privilege and run this privilege and see the performance differences. And again, restore and auto grow are ones you really care about. Well, what, you know, that's an interesting feature, Bob. Uh, we've heard of that before. It's nice that setup added that. But what about something cool? Uh, well, this one I think is pretty cool. Um, it's called persisted log buffer. And it's actually a good example of us not just taking advantage of existing hardware technologies, but staying ahead of the game. So, you know, in many scenarios, specifically like an OLTP application, the, the, the speed of writing to the log is really the bottleneck for the speed of the application. And if you think about the evolution of storage here, if you think about traditional hard drives and even early SSD drives, the latency or the transfer speed of these disks are thought in terms of milliseconds, right? You know, you might take an older type of drive and say, oh, yeah, it typically takes about 10 milliseconds to seek the drive, you know, to, tr to transfer bytes to the drive. And the, and the older SSDs, are, and, and some of them are like, you know, one or two millisecond type time frame, right? And so if you think about this new technology of PCI SSDs, in fact, my laptop has one of these. And if you've never seen it before, uh, it, you know, I've opened up my laptop to look at it. It's a little memory card looking device. It looks like uh, memory chips. And it's actually a drive. And in many cases, the latency for these are less than a millisecond. That's what that symbol is. That's microseconds, right? So, you know, that's interesting. Uh, but if you're really tired of write log weights, if you actually are saying, look, I really want to maximize performance for any transaction log latency scenarios, there's a new technology called NVDIM. Uh, and this symbol is nanoseconds. And in fact, if you go look here a little bit of searching on the Internet, this is also referred to as persistent memory. This is also a technology that in the hardware level, almost looks like memory, but really is persisted storage with battery backup and the whole type of thing. Now today, this technology is smaller in size. You know, the, the ones you've seen by some of the manufacturers out there, and you can look for this, are like eight gig in size, but I think you're gonna see this get bigger. And so we thought, we saw this technology, and we said, how can we take advantage of this technology? I mean, eight gig's not a lot, right? But, but we thought about the transaction log and how it exists in memory and said, you know what, we can take advantage of this technology. So the Windows Server team in 2016 also recognizes technology. And you can actually configure one of these as a drive, just as a drive letter on your machine. And so normally with Windows Server 16, you can just support it as a normal drive and you'll get a performance boost. But there's a new interface called Direct Access or DAX uh, with Windows 16 that can recognize these drives. And here's how it kind of works. You take one of these drives, if you configure with Windows, and you format the NTFS volume with this special parameter called DAX. Well, SQL Server in SP1 for 16 will recognize this. And so if you'll take a second transaction log file, you build your normal transaction log file on your normal drive. It, maybe it's a PCI drive. Maybe it's some sort of SSD drive of a certain size. That's your transaction log. Maybe it's 100 gig. I don't know. This smaller, smaller drive, you format as a second log file on it. 
Now SQL Server automatically recognizes as an NVDIM drive or one of these DAX formatted drives. And now the tail of the log, which is the active log in cache, can now be a memory copy to make your commits very fast. So effectively, we can take a look at the active log that we're going to flush to disk. We say, you know what? We're just going to copy that to one of these NVDIM drives, which is like a memory copy. And we're going to let your commit proceed. And then lazily behind the scenes, we'll take that data from the smaller tail of the log drive and we'll flush it to the, your normal transaction log drive. So, and since it's persisted and it's guaranteed to survive any kind of uh, restart of the machine, you're never inconsistent. And when we restart, we go and look for any files in that uh, drive and we copy it to the normal transaction log. And now write log weights become zero. In fact, it's kind of a funny story. When we're looking at these benchmarks here, we're running these things, we're looking at DM exec request, and we're seeing a wait type of write log and a wait time of zero. Now that's not like a bug, that's just because the write log waits are less than a millisecond. So all of a sudden we've got to reevaluate our DMVs now <laughs> and decide, you know, a hey, millisecond's not the new standard now, right, for these things. Um, so there's some interesting videos for you to take a look at the actual demos of these technologies. It's now available in SP1, fully supported for you to use. And Kevin Farley's done a really nice job of a really gory, detailed blog post to show you visuals of how we actually take advantage and use that technology. And, you know, we can get 2x speeds using this over even this fast new PCI SSD type technology. So cool example of us taking advantage of new, uh, new functionality new technology inside uh, hardware and staying kind of ahead of the game. Uh, and if you think about a, a really good scenario here is in memory OTP. In memory OTP, as you know, is in memory, right? But we still have to write logs to the transaction log. So, you know, if you're looking to maximize performance for a scenario using that type of feature in SQL Server, using this technology was something to certainly take a look at. So this is something uh, new I added to the talk that I haven't done before. Uh, we'll talk a little bit query processing here. Uh, and the fact that window functions are going batch now in SQL 16, and I've got the, 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 the I've, I've, I've hijacked the Microsoft Windows symbol here, not because this has anything to do with the Windows operating system, because it has to do with Windows functions. Now, I have to admit to you that before I did the slide, I wasn't a big uh, person who knew deeply about window functions, uh, but I'm a huge fan now after, after looking at this technology. In fact, I've made, given you a pointer here to Itzit Ben-Gan's blog post about what this technology is. And if you're somebody that does a lot of time doing aggregation or doing a lot of analytic type queries and you're struggling with like all these sub-queries and self-joins and limitations of group by, you got to take a look at this T-SQL type functionality. It's something that could be very powerful for you. And we've introduced these functions back in, in 2012 even, and we've iterated on them over the releases. Now, Starting in, in, in a previous release with column store technology, we introduced this concept called batch mode. And if you think about SQL Server, it's a very row-oriented type uh, technology. But there are many scenarios where we've discovered as we're doing query processing where we should perform things at the batch level, not the row level. Why not take a batch of 900 rows and perform an operation against it versus a row-by-row row type uh, uh, thinking? And we've seen great performance benefits for this batch mode in column store since we started doing that. So now we kind of combine the two worlds. Uh, you know, when you're using these window functions uh, with SQL Server, let's take a look and use batch mode on top of that. And this is an example of what a, a window function query could look like. This over clause is key to this entire scenario where you're providing a partitioning scheme and you're providing what's called a frame type of syntax here and then providing an aggregation on top of that window function. And I, you know, after going to the demo I'm going to show you in a second, I really, I think I'm going to put a blog post together called like Window Functions for the Rest of Us. <laughs> maybe it's going kind to of maybe, you know, explain more what those look like. But after going through and breaking down how this works, it's kind of quite clever how these work. On the right here is an interesting chart. This is the chart we've seen from scalability using this technology. Uh, with window function and aggregation and other type of window functions, <clears throat> the, the red line represents the row processing speed and the blue line represents the batch mode speed. And you can see here, as parallelism has increased, how scalable we can get across the board. Let's go take a look at one of these things. Um, now, when you look at these queries here, you're going to say, hey, man, there's no way I understand, you know, just from your demo here what this all looks like. These are actually two CTEs, common table expressions. You got a with clause here and another here and a select using it. So the second CTE uses the first CTE and the select uses the second CTE. But here's the use of these functions. Here's the lag function and here's an over clause and here's a sum function and an over clause. 
And what this demo is showing you, it's, it's kind of simulating clicks on a website, like trying to do some analysis of how many times people have clicked in certain intervals of time uh, for what we call a session for a given IP address. And what I've got here in the demo you can see here is two tables, one called Clickstream Row and one over here called just Clickstream. Now I'll kick off the Clickstream Row query and then I'll click off the Clickstream normal query. The difference between the two tables is very simple. One has a column store index and one doesn't. <laughs> Clickstream has a column store index. Clickstream row here has not a column store index. And if you run these particular queries, you'll observe their performance. In fact, the Clickstream uh, one with the column store index will come back uh, a lot quicker than the Clickstream row uh, query. And when you take a look at the results of these, like this one came back here in about 19 seconds, this one's going to take longer. When you go take a look at the operators here, this is the key to this whole technology here. We've introduced a new operator in plans that you'll recognize called window aggregate. And you'll see here the estimated execution mode is called batch. So whenever you see this new windows aggregate operator, this is an example where we've taken these window functions that you may use in your queries and we've implemented this new batch mode when you have a column store index. You can see here, it says column store index scan as part of the query. And if you come back here, you can see here, this took like 46 seconds to run. The only difference between these two tables is a column store index. That's it. Uh, and just to tell you how serious we are about our technology here, if I go over here and run add add version against this server, you notice here, this is vNext, but not just vNext, this is vNext on Linux. So I'm running these queries on a Linux VM on this laptop. And just to know you how I built this demo, I took the demo scripts that I had on SQL 16 on Windows, I propped up a Linux VM in about 15 minutes. That's how long it took me. I installed the databases, I ran the queries, and that was it. That's all it took. So in 30 minutes, roughly, I had a Linux demo running with no changes at all to the SQL syntax or the tables. So that's how serious we are about learning Linux. Things can work just as they do uh, on Windows. So that's a quick little demo of Windows aggregation. Take a look at Windows functions for analytic queries. Very powerful uh, technology. So the last topic we're going to talk about here today, and then we're going to you know, leave our time for uh, plenty of time for questions. And, and just to let you know, I'm going to let Brent moderate those questions. Um, I'm sure there's a ton of them on there, but I'll let him kind of ask them. And, and I love having dialogues with Brent anyway, so it'll be fun to have that interaction. <laughs> um, so let's talk about always unavailability groups and why I think there are turbocharged in 16. So I think the always unavailability group design is pretty good. And we started that uh, work in 2012 as an enhancement we did in database mirroring. Um, back in those days, uh, the hardware designs that were being used in primary machines and even on secondary machines was pretty good, but not lightning fast to compare to today's time frame. And so what we noticed in 2014 was customers coming to us saying, hey, here's what I'm doing. I've got an always-on system I'm trying to prop up. I'm putting on a single sync replica as a secondary. And all of a sudden, my overall transaction performance is going as tanking. And, and this is not what I'm looking for. You know, I, I need high availability, which is great. I'd love to have that, but I can't have performance go that bad on my primary just because I have a single sync replica propped up. And so we started taking a hard look at some of these customers and say, okay, what is wrong here? Is it an IO bottleneck? You know, what's going on? And, you know, customers saying, hey, wait a minute now. I purchased, like, the fastest secondary machine I could find. I put a really fast disk on there. I've got a high-speed net connection between the two. Um, I've got a multi-core machine on there. You know, what else do I have to do to make this fast, right? And so, you know, we, we at first said, okay, it's got to be a hardware problem. And then we took back and said, like, no, maybe it's not, right? So we took up the architecture of, of, of always on availability and said, you know what, there's some, there's some bottlenecks in our code here. There's some problems we need to take a look at. And so there's a couple of the factors that we looked at as part of this. In Mermil TP, as we talked about, transaction log performance is king here to making that fast, right? So if you want to put that into an HA scenario with AGs, you got to make that really fast. And then if you didn't know this or not, the replication technologies you see behind the scenes, like geo-replication for Azure SQL Database, well, it uses the always-on available group technology behind the scenes. So those guys were saying, hey, this has got to be fast. you got to make it really, really good. And so you can see here there's a need to take a look at uh, making this uh, our code and making the algorithms design better. And so we created a couple of mantras. We said, hey, we want to be 95% as fast as standalone speed uh, doing our benchmarks with a single sync replica. Well, what does standalone mean? Standalone means I don't even have an AG. So I just prop up a machine, I run a transaction workload and a benchmark, and then if I add AG and a sync replica to that mix, I want to be 95% as fast as that original scenario. HADR sync commit is a wait type 
that you can see when there's a latency in us trying to actually harden the log on a secondary. So we wanted to make sure that some of those latents we, we see, at least on medium type workloads, would be less than a millisecond. Those are benchmarks we internally created for our own team. We said we need to meet those to make sure we're keeping up with today's technology. And so this is kind of stuff we did. This is an interesting one, the first one. We literally whiteboarded out the entire design. And we said, what is the number of context switches for threads that have to take place to start a transaction in the primary, you know, ship it over to the secondary, and bring it back, right? And it took 15 worker thread context switches. And we said, okay, we can make that better. So we took it down to eight. Uh, we actually made it, you know, it takes 10 with encryption, a couple extra, right? We improved the communication path. The first one's an interesting point. The log writer is the background thread submitting these changes to disk. So we said, hey, if that secondary can keep up really quickly, instead of farming off the log writer work to a separate set of threads to go ship it to the secondary, let's let log writer submit it directly to the secondary. Now that's only going to work if this is really fast, right? Because we don't want to keep the log writer from doing other work on the primary. Another example though, of a streamlining the process. And other things we did, a lot of things in parallel you can see here, right? Streaming log blocks in parallel. Multiple log writers on primary and secondary. I mentioned that as a scenario earlier on the talk. Parallel log redo, something we're adding onto these secondaries because it's doing continuous redo. And then just us taking a look at the code saying, hey, we don't need to spin lock here. This algorithm could be better. A lot of it using benchmarks and using things like X event, X perf, other technologies behind the scenes to see where in the code could improvements be made. All of these things uh, taking place. And this is kind of the results. I did a blog post on this called Always on Turbocharge where we publicly uh, listed these results here. This is a OLTP workload based on our benchmarks that we've done internally here. And let me explain how this graph works here. So the number of users are here on the x-axis. The log throughput on the primary, which is a way to measure the overall throughput of the scenario and the workload, is here on the y-axis. And the blue line represents the standalone workload. So you can see here the performance of a throughput. It does bottom off. But as we get to a certain number of users on our test, you can see how the blue line on the standalone works. The yellow line represents the throughput for 2014. <laughs> not good. You see the diff between the yellow line here and the blue line. That's not what we're looking for here. The orange line represents SQL 16. And if you actually take these numbers, I actually did it myself before I published this, this difference is about 5%. So we are achieving now this 5 to 95% goal of standalone speed. And the gray line represents with encryption. So kind of the results here, a single sync replica at 95%, two replicas 90%, in, with encryption 90%, and two replicas 85%. And these latencies were down in less than a millisecond. This is the specs of the machines we use both for the primary and the secondary. And yeah, they're, they're fast machines that you look here, but they're not just like the most expensive machines on the planet to build. Um, and so yeah, you, you know, somebody asked me when I did this before, like, hey, can I get that kind of speed? And my response is, sure, <laughs> I think you can. Uh, and, uh, you know, the key is, I think, is the secondary. Uh, a lot of people build primary machines out in these AG scenarios that are pretty quick. Uh, but typically in the secondary scenarios, if they're using it as a sync replica, they're not thinking in terms of a fast machine. But if your goal is to achieve and, and maintain HA, uh, but keep the primary transactions at a high speed rate, then you need to make an investment, you know, on that secondary machine. Now, if you're doing async replicas for read-only purposes and other scenarios, you know, those don't have to be near as fast, obviously, right? But if you have the right hardware in place, our design, we think, can keep up uh, with the pace of what hardware you've built. You know, and that's it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I talked about today, uh, but here's other stuff we've blogged about, right? These are things that are pointed directly onto our Bob SQL blog, and here's other stuff we need to brag, I mean, blog about. Here's mm -hmm. other things uh, within the engine that I haven't even talked about today and we haven't even blogged about yet. But we know from our notes and our interviews we did with the product team, there are other things uh, that we're going to introduce and we're going to keep that blog series alive by adding new new types of things. And I'm really serious about trying to get uh, feedback from people in scenarios where 16 is not faster. Uh, one of the things I do internally at Microsoft since I talk a lot of this topic is I pay attention uh, to things that where people report, hey, I moved to 16 but this isn't as fast. Now, one scenario that I've seen, and you may need to be aware of, is the fact that some people are moving from SQL 2012 or 2008 to 16, and we're using this new cardinality estimation model that we have for query processing. That is one scenario where I've seen customers struggle some, and there is compatibility levels to help offset any issues you have there, and technologies like Query Store to go look and observe the differences between those. 
Um, so I'm trying to do a little more investigation there to see, you know, how much do I need to get out to the community about scenarios where that may not be faster for you uh, to be just just be objective about the fact that not every single thing you're going to do is going to be fast. But I think I've given you a lot of examples today where things are faster. Here's some resource for you. If you actually look at this moniker, AKMS SQL 2016 Faster, that actually points to every blog post that we've tagged and that we're going to tag that deal with this topic. The SQL CAT team has some really cool blog posts about things in SQL 16 that are really interesting. Some are about performance, some not. Some overlap with some of the things we've talked about. And then this is just a pointer to what's new in the database engine. Uh, and I'm sure you have some questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, this is my email. This is my my Twitter Twitter handle, uh, and this is a hashtag I've been using for a lot of my tweets. And this is a pointer to our new our new uh, SQL called Bob SQL. You can just search for that on the internet. And then behind the scenes here, I'll go back to the slide. These are all the the, the different bonus material slides uh, for details about things that we didn't talk about today. But hey. Brent, <laughs> yes. what can I pour into a session for you, man? <laughs> That's fantastic. And thanks for, you know, it's great technical. Lots of people are uh, commenting over on Twitter, things that they'd seen out there. It was very slick. Uh, two people, Diane and Dan, both said, love the shirt, go Cowboys. That's uh, that's probably the best comment I'm going to get the entire day today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dexter asks, on TempDB file growth, he said, why the one gig limit on file size during setup? Hmm. That's a good question, and I've had that question before, and I'm looking into that one with our, our team that runs a setup team. I don't. I think the reason why, by the way, Dexter, is that um, we were worried on uh, – we don't use instant file initialization uh, until you've installed, right? So I think what I've heard before is during the setup process, instant file initialization is not kicked in. So we were worried about the time it takes to run setup with a very large database size for TempDB. I believe that's the technical details, but that's what I'm still trying to follow up on. I've heard that – uh, complaint before. Josh asks, when you change the service account for SQL Server, do you have to manually perform that uh, the lock page or uh, perfmon instant file? In, <laughs> perfmon. Yeah, I, I know, Brent. Isn't it crazy? Nobody remembers the name of that. Yeah, I'm like, I, I, I I don't even, yeah, yeah the, the, the answer is yes. Um, yes, there is. You know, if you're going to change the service account, you must go into what's called the local policy editor and make that change. I need to just post a blog post on the PowerShell script to automate it, right? Because <laughs> I'm so tired of figuring it out. I, I myself have to remember, what was the name of that app I have to go in and run? But yes, um, if you change the account after you run setup, you must go in and make the change yourself. Matan Youngman asks, just out of curiosity, why was the number 900 chosen? And I think he's thinking back to the windowing functions demo, and I can't remember where the 900 was. Uh, 900... Yeah, I don't remember where that was in the demo. Uh, maybe they can uh, tell you more about the detail. I don't remember. Where, I don't remember where 900 was used. All right, cool. Oh, oh, I talked about batches. Yes, sorry, that was just an example. Uh, okay. 900 is not a fixed batch number we use for batch mode processing. Um, the the batch mode is just going to vary depending on how much we think we can process. So I just picked 900 as an example, but it, it's not 900 is not a fixed number for how we do batch mode. Yeah, Matan. I think that's what he was talking about. Yeah. yeah, batch mode vector size. Nico yeah. chimes in and says something about 912 rows as well. Let's yeah, see. Not a fixed number. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, so many good ones. Um, our Mikhail asks: Are there any plans for making use of batch mode operators for windowing functions, even when there's no column store index present on the table? I was going to get that question. <laughs> I don't know. Great question. Um, I can go back and ask the team uh, that's built that functionality, and, and they're the ones that actually we are talking about adding this to the deck. But I don't know of any plans to do that, but that's a question I still need to go back and ask those guys. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any plans right now that I'm aware of. Mohammed asks, uh, regarding CheckDB being faster, are there any real-world production examples or stats that we can read about? Man, I would push that back on you, Mohammed. Go get yourself a dev server now that 2016 is free. Man, it's so easy to go download and install. I want to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, super easy. Yeah, I, there's nothing out there that I'm aware of. In fact, I think, it, but there may be. Um, the, the, a lot of the guys in the CAT team that deal with the SAP uh Software suite. There are a lot of the guys that help in many cases. Up, look at these. Look at these. Uh, they may be. They may be posting something on their tests using SAP databases. But I'm not aware of a specific one that's posted out there. All right. Uh, Alexander says, uh, "Hi, Bob from Brazil. When will SQL Server implement parallel rollback?" Oh, wow. Wow. He parallel roll. You know, here's here's the funny thing for you. If you go look closely at my X event session. There's an actual line that says parallel rollback enabled. <laughs> and really? so 
Yeah, it, it is. It, it's in there, but uh, that's a little bit of a faux pas <laughs> because it's not enabled. <laughs> it, it's an entry we added to this trace because we were taking a look at that, and so I'm not aware of the details of when we might implement something like that, but but if you see that in the X event trace, it doesn't mean it actually is enabled, but there was some thought when we first started looking at this about doing that, but that doesn't wow. exist today. Ah, okay, cool. Uh, let's see here. John says, where can I download the slides? You can go right onto the URL there on the screen. Uh, Jim says, how much coffee did Bob have this morning? He's a fast talker, <laughs> and I'm only on the fast on the fee of first cup. JD asks an interesting question. Uh, for SSIS, do you know about any improvements in performance for SSIS in 2016? Great question, JD. I'm not aware of any performance improvements. And this is, and I, by the way, quick, uh, quick answer. It's my third cup, so. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. I'm, uh, not, I'm not aware of any specific on performance. I'm not aware of any enhancements for SSIS. Uh, Sam says, would you still recommend using domain accounts for the SQL service server service account, um, or if I use the NT service accounts, can I get instant file initialization with those? So, um, you know, the security choices you make for domain accounts or service accounts is independent of performance, obviously, right? Um, and so there's all sorts of security considerations when you use domains. Um, but as far as the instant finalization answer goes, Windows admins are the only ones by default that get that privilege. So anything else uh, would have to be added yourself. And then JD says he's an Army Reserve Chief Warrant Officer and there's no such thing as too much coffee. <laughs> I did go pretty fast this morning. I have to admit, uh, it was pretty early for me, and I did kind of crank it up a little bit uh, on, on, on the speed. I apologize for that. Hopefully everybody uh, got that. That's why you have the recording, Brent. Right? Exactly. Can... Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. And tra it's, you're going to give our transcriptionist a workout as well, yes. <laughs> that's right, exactly, probably. All right, well, I want to thank Bob for uh, volunteering to speak here today. He totally came here out of his own you know, loving heart to help you guys out and teach you about SQL Server 2016. I would have everybody give him a round of applause, but, of course, he can't hear you. Um, you golf can follow clap, him on maybe? A little golf, golf clap? clap. <laughs> yes, in front of the webcam. Um, okay. You can follow him on uh, Twitter over Bob Ward MS. And uh, thanks a lot for volunteering today, Bob. I really appreciate it. Love being here, Brent. Thanks. Thanks.